Thanks everyone to, for joining us again uh, for the third part of the research highlights session at, at the Lehman Conference um, 2020. So for this part of the session, we'll have four presentations and we will start. Our first presentation will be by Dr. Michael Sweeney. Uh, Dr. Sweeney is a microbiologist and um, he's interested in research of uh, new and existing antimicrobial compounds for animal health. He works with Soeris. He's part of the bovine and swine respiratory disease surveillance program. And he's, a, he's been a researcher with Soeris for a number of years. He's a member of the working group and chairperson for the Veterinary Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing Subcommittee of the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute. Now he will be talking to us about the trends in my antimicrobial susceptibility of various bacterial species um, over the years. Thank you, Dr. Sweeney. Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Sweeney, and I'm a senior principal scientist at Zoetis in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Today, I'd like to present to you antimicrobial susceptibility of actinobacillus pleuronemoniae, Mosterella maltacida, Streptococcus suis, and Bordetella bronchoseptica, isolated from the United States and Canada in the years 2016 to 2019. Before I get into that information, I'd like to give a brief background on our Zoetis surveillance program. Currently, we have four programs in place a bovine and swine program, which was started in 1998, and in which we, in 2019, uh, received about 2,500 isolates from 25 laboratories in North America. Additionally, as you can see in the screen here, we have a mastitis program, an equine program, and a companion animal pathogen, respectively. So why does Zoetis do antimicrobial surveillance? Well, since Zoetis is the pharmaceutical leader in veterinary and microbial agents, we understand that there's concern over bacterial resistance both in human health and animal health. So as a leader in an infectives, we feel that surveillance data is very important in defining trends when we look at resistance for our antibiotics as well as other antibiotics. And it also helps us understand mechanisms of action for antimicrobial resistance. The goals of our program is to collect bacterial pathogens from across the United States and Canada or North America that represents the population of animals in all regions. We feel this then provides valuable information to veterinarians on how they can uh, prescribe antibiotics for their use for animals. And as I mentioned earlier, it's really helpful in expanding our understanding of mechanisms of resistance and particularly multidrug resistance. And of course, the goals of our program, the overall goal is to support responsible use of antibiotics. The design of our program is a passive surveillance program. That is, we take, we collect isolates from sick or dead animals. We don't collect isolates from um, unsick or well animals. Our program enrolls veterinary diagnostic laboratories on a yearly basis. Those laboratories then send specific bacterial pathogens to offer testing, and all of our antimicrobial susceptibility testing is done using clinical and laboratory standards or CLSI methods. Our laboratory partners, as I mentioned, are across the United States and Canada, mostly diagnostic laboratories. Uh, we've chosen these laboratories to gain maximum ge ge geographic distribution of these pathogens. The expenses for these pathogens that are sent to us are paid by Zoetis. And every other year, we have a meeting with our laboratory partners where we share that data, the antimicrobial susceptibility data with them. The strains that we get from those laboratories, as I mentioned, are from sick or dead animals. We feel they represent a geographically diverse collection. Uh, we, we don't ask for treatment status, but if it is given to us, we appreciate that information. And we ask for a maximum number of isolates from each lab so we don't have any bias from a particular area, but no minimum number is required on a yearly basis. And we bank all of our pathogens, and as of this year, we now have over 125,000 isolates. 
So here are the pathogens that we collect from all the programs. For this talk, I want to specific focus specifically on the swine respiratory disease pathogens. As you can see, we collect Pasteurella multacida, Actinobacillus pleuronomoniae, Mortatella bronchoseptica, Streptococcus suis, E. coli, and Salmonella for our particular program. We understand our surveillance programs have certain limitations and biases, and I just want to spend a minute to go through those real quick. As again, as I mentioned, we have a passive surveillance program, so we are collecting isolates from sick or dead animals. So that does uh, uh, introduce some type of sampling bias. Um, the information on sampling and treatment history is not always available, but that's okay. And the study design variations make direct comparisons to other programs difficult. This is especially important for uh, trying to harmonize programs. So we cannot compare our data with another program that uses different methods. So that's the biggest problem in surveillance is the lack of harmonization amongst programs. Additionally, we ask on a yearly basis, how can we limit the bias in our surveillance programs? And so some of the questions that we ask on a yearly basis is, what is a sample source that we're getting? Uh, how are the samples chosen? Were they randomized? Were they, what, were they from a particular facility, a slaughterhouse, et cetera? Another question we ask is, what's the health status of the animal, the disease state of the animal, the geographic distribution of the isolates, for antimicrobial susceptibility testing, were interpretive criteria used? And if so, were they from CLSI methods or the UCAST methods? And then a big factor is the testing method is as, that is used. Was it agar dilution method or a macro dilution or a micro dilution method? So those are questions that we ask on a yearly basis to limit the bias that we have in our programs. So now that I've given a background of the Zoetis program, I'd like to jump right into the antimicrobial susceptibility data for our swine pathogens that we collect. Um, as you can see down here, we have the antibiotics that have breakpoints from CLSI for some or all the pathogens that we collect in our program. So as the presentation mentions, we are going to show data from 2016 to 2019. First, we'll start with swine pastoral tosida. So we have resistance versus the year from 2016 to 2019. And down here, I've focused on the last two years of our program. So for P. maltosida in 2019, we tested 174 isolates, of which 46.5% were resistant to tetracycline, 2.4% were resistant to telmycosin, 1.7% were resistant to ampicillin, as well as penicillin, and for the remaining drugs here, telethromycin, ceftiafir, enrofloxacin, and florfenicol, we can see 1.1% or less resistance to those drugs. And this tracks similarly with what we saw in 2018 as well. Since we do have an ongoing surveillance program, I thought I'd also share with you the last 20 years of data for P. multosta from pigs. So rather than just focusing on 2016 and 19, I'm spanning this from 2000 to 2019. But we also see a similar trend that we see for 2016 to 19, is that the most resistance we see is with tetracycline, this that's up here, and then we see very, very low resistance for the remaining drugs. And we've been seeing this for the last 20 years. So that's very good news for this pattern. For actinobacillus pleuronomoniae, in 2019, we tested 48 isolates, of which about 71% were resistant to tetracycline. And then for the remaining drugs, ampicillin, telmycosin, enrofloxacin, florfenicol, staphetiafir, and telathromycin, we have 2.1% or less resistance to those drugs. Similarly, if we look at the last 20 years, we also see very low rates of resistance, especially since 2015 onwards for the most of the drugs, except for, again, tetracycline. In an ampicillin, we saw about 15% resistance, but then it dropped off quite a lot for 2019. 
for Streptococcus suis, we tested 238 isolates in 2019. Uh, and throughout the years from 2016 to 2019, again, saw very low resistance um, for most of the antibiotics. For tetracycline, saw virtually 100% resistance to that drug, followed by penicillin at about 20%. In 2019, the CEFTIF resistance jumped up a little bit compared to 2018, but we're doing some retesting right now just to make sure that number is real. So we expect that number to fall down a little bit. And then enterofloxus and ampicillin and fluorofenicol, very low resistance. Similarly, looking at 20 years, other than penicillin and again, tetracycline, we see very, very low resistance for streptococcus suis to the antibiotics we test in our program. For Bordetella bronchoseptica, there are only three drugs that have clinical and laboratory standards institute breakpoints. And so from 2019, or rather 2016 and 19, we saw 100% resistance to ampicillin, 0% resistance to, to telethromycin, rather. And then in 2019, about 13% resistance to fluorofenicol. That's a bit misleading, however, because we saw 83% that were intermediate to that drug and only 3.6% that were susceptible. If we look at 10 years worth of data from 2010 to 19, again, we see similar trends, 100% resistance to ampicillin, 0% resistance to lathromycin, and then variable resistance to fluorofenicol. If we flip this information around, rather than looking at percent resistance, instead of we look at percent susceptibility, the higher the bar here, the, the more susceptible we are seeing. So you can see that for all the drugs, pretty much, except again for tetracycline, we see at least 90% or more resist, excuse me, susceptibility to those drugs in general. So that's the swine data that we see uh, from 2016 to 19, and again from 2000 to 2019. I want to contrast what we're seeing for same data with some cattle pathogen data as well. So we have a number of drugs that show that have breakpoints for the pathogens that we also collect in our programs. And so, for example, for Mannheimi hemolytica, you notice that the percent resistance we see is much higher than what we see for the swine side of things. So in 2019, we tested 426 M hemolytica. And even though we're not seeing as high as tetracy tetracycline resistance as we do for some of the swine pathogens, in general, we're seeing about at least 10% resistance to the drugs that we test, except for ceftiofir, where we see 0% resistance or 100% susceptibility. This is also true for bovine pastorella multacida. Again, we see rates of, of resistance that are fairly higher than what we see with swine pathogens and for Histophilus somni as well, uh, where we're seeing high rates of resistance to tetracycline uh, and about 21.7% resistance to lathromycin and about 10% to penicillin. Additionally, we're interested in looking at multi-drug resistance. On the swine, swine side of things, since the resistance is so low, we don't see any multi-drug resistance at all. But on the cat side of things, we see a little bit higher rates of multi-drug resistance. For M. hemolytic, for example, uh, we tested 426 isolates, of which 1.9% of those isolates were fully susceptible. 65.2% were resistant to a drug in at least one class. 12% were resistant to a drug in two classes. 5.8% were resistant to drugs in three classes, 2.1 in four classes, and 13% were resistant to drugs in five classes. So this is fairly significant. A few years back, we published a paper that provided definitions for multidrug resistance in veterinary medicine. And so with that publication, we can define resistance to M. hemolytica, in this case, multidrug resistance being at a rate of 20.9% in 2019. Again, resistant to three, four, five drug classes, so a rate of 20.9% compared to 2018, where we saw 26% resistance.
So overall for swine surveillance, our summary is that we see overall high susceptibility for all drug pathogen combinations, except for tetracycline. All P. multocida and APP isolates in the past 20 years of the program have tested 100% susceptible to ceftiavir. And all P. multocida, bordetella, bronchoseptica, and APP have tested 100% susceptible to telethromycin. And as I mentioned earlier, we see little to no resistance for swine pathogens with regards to multi drug resistance. If you're interested in knowing more about our Zoetis swine surveillance program, we published a paper a few years back in the Journal of Swine Health Production um, with this title right here. Feel free to look that up and read that paper. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. So in conclusion, Zoetis is committed to ongoing susceptibility surveillance. We strongly believe in replacing anecdotal evidence with good science. We feel this data really helps us understand mechanisms of resistance and multi-drug resistance rates. And again, most importantly for our surveillance program, it helps us to support responsible use for veterinarians. Uh, some of my other colleagues that run the other programs, I've listed their information here. If you have a question about companion animal or equine surveillance or even bovine mastitis, or you can reach me at this email address as well. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Dr. Sweeney, for that wonderful talk. Um, uh, it's a nice overview of antibiotic uh, susceptibility. Um, so we'll go to our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Gustavo Lopez. Gustavo Lopez is a uh, is um, a, a graduate student at the University of Minnesota. Uh, his main research is on uh, looking at novel epidemiological tools to investigate the occurrence of animal uh, infectious diseases, especially transboundary diseases. Um, uh, and providing science-based solutions for decision making. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, he has uh, developed and has used several methods of modeling disease distributions across uh, globally, and uh, uh, and and is working on uh, um, a practical mapping of the spread of inf infectious diseases, especially in the pig population. Okay, today, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Gustavo is going to talk to us about. Um, a detection of influenza A virus in swine farm workers before and after work. Gustavo. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, the title of my presentation is Detection of Influenza A Virus in Swine Farm Workers Before and After Work. First, let's talk about influenza in the swine industry. It's one of the most important respiratory pathogens causes cough, sneezing, fever, uh, secondary infections, and it has an impact on the growth and the feed conversion of the pigs. The subtypes H1N1, H3N2, and H1N2 are endemic in swine herds. It is a widespread disease. Uh, it's a with year-round detection with seasonal pigs. Influenza is an evolving virus, eh, which makes it very difficult to control. Typical of RNA viruses, it sustains mutations, and because it's a segmented virus, it, it can have gene reassortment with other circulating influences that give emergence to new strains. As you see in the graphic here on the right, we have the human influenza, avian, and the classical swine, how they reassorted, changing internal segments, which gave origin to the swine triple reassortant that further on had another reassortment and gave origin to the 2009 pandemic influenza called the swine flu. All these things have make, made it very difficult to control through our vaccination and our management practices in the swine farms. Influenza is a shared pathogen between animals and people. Although there is certain tropism of subtypes by species, human, swine, and poultry share a good amount of subtypes, uh, which are here in this graphic highlighted. There is uh, enough evidence of zoonosis, uh, meaning the animals or the pigs giving influenza to the humans. But more recently, a lot of evidence have supported actually the reverse zoonosis in where people are giving influenza to the pigs. Influenza is a public health concern. 
uh, infections in people with, with swine influenza viruses are not common, but when, it, when they do happen, they can be significant and can result in pandemics. Uh, swine workers have higher risk of influenza exposure than the normal population. And that was a study a few years ago, uh, Dr. Gray, that showed that swine farm workers had higher seroprevalence of uh, influenza than the normal population. And th this is evidence of the e uh, excess exposure to influenza than, than the normal population. The CDC estimates around half a million of hospitalizations related to influenza each season. And on the right hand, we can see the different events throughout the history in where animal origin influenza has infected humans. So it is a public health concern. It's no longer considered a just one species disease. The diversity we see in influenza is shaped by the introductions of human influenza viruses. Here on the left hand, we see a graphic from Dr. Martha Nelson. In the vertical line, we see 20 different events and on the horizontal line, the years where they occurred. And what this graphic is represented, these are human influenza viruses that managed to enter the swine population and persisted for more than a year. Some of them even established, adapted, reassorted with swine uh, circulating viruses and are a common finding. And these are these four introductions here the, in the black uh, shape. They represent internal genes that actually adapted and stay within the pigs. And uh, the best example of this is the, the matrix gene of the uh, 2009 pandemic influenza that is now a common finding in the pigs after the pandemic as, as evidence that the, the disease went from the humans to the pigs. This leads us to our study and the specific aims is that we wanted to impl implement a surveillance system at the worker swine interface to, to study the influenza transmission between the pigs and the people, or not only the people, but the farm workers. We wanted to evaluate the positivity in swine farm workers before and after work and see if we could identify risk factors that are associated with influenza detection in the farm workers. For that, the, this study, it was a two-year study in which we enrolled seven commercial sow farms with a history of influenza in the pigs. We enrolled 66 workers enrolled voluntarily uh, out of which 60 completed the study. And we were monitoring the CDC and the state seasonal influenza reports, trying to see when was the onset of the influenza season to start our sampling on the humans. Uh, the sampling took place during eight weeks on during the human flu season. This is a graphic of the study timeline. As you can see, the study took eight weeks, the red stars represent the sampling points on the pigs. We did that in three times at the beginning of the study, towards the middle of the study, and at the end. Uh, the, the yellow stars represent sampling events on the humans or the farm workers. We did that more intensively. We did it twice a week for eight weeks before and after the enter and after work. And here below, we can see a graphic from the CDC. This is a report that's generated weekly. So we will be monitoring and when we saw an uptick or a rise on the cases of influenza, that's when we will give the signal to the farm to begin the sampling. Uh, the farm workers self-collected their nasal swabs as depicted in the picture. They did it themselves before and after for eight weeks, two times a week. So basically every three to four days, the workers were sampling themselves. They were also self-collecting their body temperature with a disposable temperature, uh, dis disposable thermometer, like the one seen in this picture. And every time they will take a sample, they will answer a questionnaire, a short questionnaire, where we'll ask simple questions like, are you showing, are you feeling any influenza symptoms like fever, coughing, sneezing? When was your last peak exposure? Which activities do you perform in the farm? The demographics and, uh, household influenza like illness report do you have a brother or a, a son or a daughter uh, feeling influenza sick those kind of questions this is trying to find those risk risk factors associated with influenza and in the on the worker once we obtained those samples for the swine uh, nasal swabs we did a pcr that targets the matrix gene uh, specific for swine 
and we will do virus isolations on MDCK cells. On the human nasal swabs, we first will do a PCR that was provided by the CDC uh, that targets both human and swine influenza A. Uh, and those who are positive, we will further test with another PCR for subtyping, also provided by the CDC, that allows us to, to, to subtype between uh, or differentiate the influenza A between H3, pandemic H1, or the seasonal H1. We also had a, a quality control, and this is a PCR uh, by, provided by the CDC, an RNA speed gene, which is a housekeeping gene that is found on humans only. So we will do this PCR to ensure that the samples that we were obtaining from the workers were actually from the workers and that the samples were stored and managed correctly. A little information about the participants, the big majority were male, 65% of them. Uh, we were also interested about their vaccination status. Where in some countries it's mandatory to, to vaccinate farm workers, in others it's recommended. But well, we saw that a big majority of our participants were not vaccinated, 65% of them. Let's look at the results on the, uh, on the pigs. Five of the seven farms that we enrolled were influenza positive at least once. We can see in this graphic from A to G, those are the, the, the farms and the three sampling points are in the columns. You can see that farm C and farm G never tested positive for influenza and farm A just had one positive. On the right hand, we can see the, the, the CT values on the Y axis and so the farm groups uh, from A to, to G. G is not here because they never tested positive. As you can see, farm E and F were highly, were very positive. The CT values were very low as indication of high concentration of influenza. When we look at the farm worker results, in six of the seven farms, or at least one worker tested influenza positive. 33 of the 60 workers, meaning 55%, tested positive at least once. So a high prevalence in terms of testing positive at least once. We collected in this table, this is the summary, we collected a total of 1,814 nasal swabs. And here is classified by farm, participants per farm. We didn't have the same amount of participants per farm because it was voluntarily. Uh, we found 58, a total of positive sample overall. Uh, that may, comes out to be at 3.2%. The CT values of those samples are depicted here on the right, where we can see the CT values on the Y axis. And on the X axis, we see the, the different farms from A to G. Again, G is not here because no positive sample. The red line represents the cutoff of positivity for this PCR, which is 40. So you can see the CT values on the, and the human results are pretty high, meaning the concentration of virus may be low compared to the, to the swine samples that were way below 30 and even below 20. An interesting finding when we were looking at uh, some risk factors is that the samples collected after work were two times more likely to test influenza positive than the morning or the before work samples. Here in this table, we can see that number of workers that tested uh, influenza positive at least once. Before work, 16 out of 60, while after work, 24 out of 60. So a higher proportion of them tested after work. When we look not at the participants, but at the number of samples as an overall, we see the similar trend. 20 of the samples were positive before work and 38 after work. When we did statistics on this, that difference was not just numerical, it was statistically significant and actually two times more likely the positives to be from samples after work. When we look at the CT values of those samples separated, so we saw this graphic on the previous slide, now this is separated by time of collection, a.m. being before work and p.m. after work. We saw that, yeah, the p.m. has a little, seems to be a lower CT values, but that difference was not significant. This is an overall, uh, and it's a busy slide. Uh, it's an overall picture of all the sampling events. We have the seven farms on the left side. We have all the participants coded by a number from one to 66, but there were 60 participants. On the horizontal line, we see the eight weeks of the study. The green squares represent a negative sample. 
The red one means a before work positive sample, and the blue one represents a after work positive sample to influenza. As I said earlier, we had 58 influenza positive samples, 20 of them before, 38 after work. We did this kind of graphic to see if we could see some kind of pattern or some clustering, and we did not. As you can see, they're pretty scattered, but we did see some interesting findings. First, a lot of standalone blue squares, standalone. So people that arrive negative to the farm, but on the way out are positive. And then on the next day, they're negative again. We think of those as exposure to the swine influenza that's circulating in the pigs. We need to do further testing of the samples to really conclude that, but it's, a, it's an indication. We also see people that tested positive consecutive samples, they're, they're circled here and here. We look at those more as not exposure, but infections per se. And that this is where we're going to look at CT values and whole genome sequencing to really assess that. Another interesting finding is that farm C and G, that those were the two farms where the peaks were negative and there was no positive samples from the workers afterwards. So uh, as you can see, there are no blue squares on them. And uh, although there were only six participants in this farm, we would have liked to have more, but it is an interesting finding nevertheless. Uh, on the subtyping, we we managed to subtype only nine of those samples, five of them to the H3 and four of them to the pandemic H1. When we look at the risk factors, uh, we're, we were thinking that um, the, the reporting of the clinical signs, fever, and where the farm workers perform chores at the farm may not be predictors of influenza positivity. For example, fever, we were expecting fever a good indication or like as a screening method, but actually only 18 people reported higher temperature than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and none of them had uh, influenza positive. And the 20 samples that were positive before entering the farm, they did not show any uh, fever, either feeling it or by the thermometer. We also were interested in the seasonal influenza vaccination. We, there was no significant difference between vaccination status of the, of the workers and, or the farm area. They seem to have the same proportional risk of being exposed to influenza. Uh, although farrowing seemed to be a little higher, statistic, statistically speaking, there was no difference. As a conclusion, all results indicate that a number of farm workers may test influenza positive when reporting to work, even though they don't have clear symptoms of influenza infection, not, not even a fever reported by a thermometer. We also found evidence of workers' exposure to influenza while working in swine farms. And additional analyses are needed to evaluate the bidirectional transmission of influenza between the farm workers and pigs and its implication in human and animal health. With that, I'd like to acknowledge everyone that helped me put this presentation together from the Swine Group at the University of Minnesota, our funding agency, the National Pork Board, and I'll take any questions. Thank you. Well, um, thank you very much, Gustavo. That was uh, a, a really nice talk. Uh, it was wonderful to hear all the, uh, all the uh, work and progress that you've made. Um, we are, we'll go to our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Chung Lee. Chung Lee uh, uh, is a DVM from um, uh, from North, uh, Northeast Agriculture University in China. He's doing a PhD here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, he is interested in um, the um, uh, uh, in swine influenza vaccination, immunity, and virus evolution, and he was working under the supervision of Dr. Uh, Monsi Teramoral, and today he's going to talk to us about uh, genotypic characterization of swine influenza resortments uh, in vaccinated and non-vaccinated pigs. Uh, Chong, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. The, the subject of my presentation today is about influenza resortment happening in the vaccinated and non-vaccinated pigs. But before that, I would like to provide some background information about this kind of virus. So swine, inf uh, swine in influenza infection is one of the top disease problems happening in US pig farms. And it can happen throughout our production stages and cause the economic loss with about three to $10 per pig. 
Until now, the vaccination is still the primary way to control the disease. Uh, it's usually implement on the south to enhance transfer of pathogen immunity to the newborn piglet. It's also very common to vaccinate the guilt of the piglet after weaning to reduce the disease impact and uh, improve the immunity. The reason why uh, inf the influenza is hard to deal with is because this is a very fast changing pathogens. They mainly change their genome by two ways. The first one called antigenic drift. That's because influenza is a negative sense RNA virus. Their RNA polymers prone to make errors during virus reproduction. These point mutations accumulate gradually over time and on their genome and uh, make the host immune system become less effective to recognize these changed virus. And finally, it could lead to the influenza epidemics. Another way called antigen shift, also known as uh, resorment. That's because the genome of influenza is segmented. So when two different influenza virus co-infect within the single cell, they could exchange their gene segment with each other and produce the progeny virus with a totally different subtype or genotype. It's more concerning because it ha usually happens abruptly and uh, it's uh, it's also facilitate the virus host jumps and the uh, immune invasion. It's kind of produce a new version of influenza virus that no person's immune system has antibody to protect against. And uh, also, uh, that's usually when an influenza pandemic can occur. So the pigs are really good at restarting influenza virus and also considered as a very important intermediate host for uh, influenza ecology. That's because both human and avian like influenza receptors are affluently co-expressed at their uh, lower respiratory tract. And also, at the same time, the pig lungs provide a suitable microenvironment for uh, resorting to generate and survive. So that's that's the reason why pigs were considered as a mixed vessel for influenza virus, which kind of provide a platform for uh, influenza originate from different hosts to co-infect and restart with each other. So when we're looking at the influenza circulation at the farm level, the recurrent and uh, co-infection of different subtype of, of influenza virus uh, are commonly detected within a single farm. These phenomena also increase the risk of the resorment. Based on the stochastic metapopulation model assessment, about 17% of co-infection events happen in the farm will finally turn into the virus resorment. There are a lot of concerns rising from the influenza resorment happening in pigs on public health and disease control. Actually, three out of four viruses that lead to uh, influenza pandemic events in history uh, emerged by restorement. And the 2009 uh, H1N1 pandemic virus uh, originated from pig populations by restorement from avian, human, and uh, swine influenza viruses. Besides, the human infections with swine restorement influenza virus have been frequently reported worldwide. The influenza restorement also poses a challenge for the disease control because it can significantly increase uh, the virus genotypic diversity and uh, uh, which makes the virus unpredictable in the pig populations and hard to control through vaccination. Therefore, it's very important to understand the factors that influence the resorment in naive and vaccinated pigs. Currently, most of our knowledge about virus resorment on influenza is based on the resorbents uh, generated by reverse genetics of the viruses naturally resorted in vitro. Although essentially important, but we still need to understand how host immunity will influence the influenza resorment. Therefore, in vivo studies are originally need to provide an in integral picture on how the uh, uh, host immune, uh, how the virus Im resorment influenced by the immune pressure. 
So the objective of our study is to quantify and characterize the virus resumption in naive and vaccinated pigs after simultaneous co-infection with H1 and H3 influenza virus. So the materials of this study are actually coming from a vaccination challenge research that we recently published in Veterinary Research Journal. Uh, that research is to explore the protective efficacy of different prime boost vaccination protocols on pigs to against the simultaneous H1N1 and H3N2 uh, virus infection. The vaccines used, used in that study are all multivalent uh, commercial inactivate and uh, level attenuated swine influenza vaccines. And we set up a c infection cedar pig model to uh, simulate the contact transmission of influenza that happens in the field by challenging uh, the naive pigs with either H1N1 or H3N2 influenza strains and commingle them with the uh, vaccinated pigs. The H1 and H3 seeders were distributed evenly as a pair of two in each room and uh, serve as uh, infection sources to shedding the uh, challenge virus to the treatment pigs from different groups. There are three rooms in total are selected based on their uh, seeders virus shedding amount and durations. And we collect the buff samples uh, from all selected pigs at seven days post uh, contact during the necropsy. Finally, uh, we, we got the buff samples from 16 pigs, which coming from three uh, vaccination treatment groups and one uh, positive control groups, and also from the cedar pigs. So the enrolled so buff sample will inoculate on the MD circuit cells directly, and uh, there are 242 plaques in total, which randomly pick up from 16 buff samples and then submit for the whole genome sequencing. The submit samples will sequence by the Illumina NextSeq platform, and the gene reads will be manipulated based on the Minnesota supercomputing system. So here is our results. This slide shows how we identify the uh, genotype for each plaque we submit. Uh, we constructed the phylogenetic trees for each gene segment by neighbor joining a uh, master with uh, 1,000 bootstrap for each gene segment. As you can see, the green and the red taxi in the trees uh, are representing the corresponding gene segment uh, of plaques that uh, originate from H3N2 or H1N1 challenge virus, respectively. The reference sequences are shown in black, and there are some plaques that contains the uh, full length sequences of the same gene segment, uh, which originates from both challenge virus. And we mark them as a blue taxon and show in the trees. So here is a summarized genotype table, uh, which shows the quantity of the isolates uh, by different gene constellations from our summit uh, plaques. 226 plaques are successfully genotyped, uh, and the other 16 plaques are classified as a mixed genotype since each of them had more than eight segments from the both uh, challenge viruses. Within the non mixed uh, plaques, 40 of them result in the uh, novel resultant viruses, which could be char characterized into 21 distinct genotypes. So the resultant viruses were detected in six out of 13 treatment pigs. However, the genotypic diversity are varied between individual pigs. About 71% of the resultants are actually contribute from just three pigs. So when we're looking at the genotypic diversity by the treatment groups, uh, we found that non-vaccinated pigs generate the largest amount of the resultant viruses with the most diversified genotypes. 
within the treatment groups, the pigs only receiving single dose lab vaccines uh, has uh, uh, got the highest proportion of the resultant viruses. But we didn't detect any resultant virus in the pig prime vaccinated by the lab vaccine and boost by the commercial killed vaccines. We didn't find the significant difference uh, between group on the resultant proportions uh, by the binomial logistic regression model, uh, mainly due to the limited number of pigs within each group. In order to explore the relationship between the vaccination and the virus resolvement, we sorted the pigs by their vaccination status and compared the resultant proportion between the groups. We found the vaccinated pigs has a lower uh, resultant proportion compared with the non-vaccinated pigs, but the difference is not significantly after the statistical analysis. However, we found the pigs receiving the prime boost vaccination has a significantly less resultant viruses compared to the non-vaccinated pigs. So here is our conclusion. First, the resultants with multiple distinct genotypes emerged within six days of simultaneous H1N1 plus H3N2 co-infection cedar pig models. Second point is the pigs receiving a prime boost vaccination protocol had less resultants than non-vaccinated pigs. I think the most important message we want to express for, from this study is the pig vaccination should be explored as a way to reduce the generation and emergence of resultant virus. And with that, I want to acknowledge the guidance from my uh, advisors and also the help from my colleague. This project was funded by the Zoetis, so I want, also want to thank to the uh, funding and support from the Zoetis team. So here is the whole part of my presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chang, for that wonderful talk. Uh, and we go to our last and final talk uh, of the research highlight session. Uh, and our last speaker uh, is um, Dr. Nakrim uh, uh, Pemarachivakul. Uh, I'm sorry, I must have mispronounced that name really badly. Um, I apologize already. Uh, Nakrim is, uh, uh, is a PhD student here at the College of Veterinary Medicine uh, at the University of Minnesota. Uh, his primary research, of course, is, is studying PERS evolutionary history, epidemiology, and pathogen host dynamics. And um, Nakrim is going to talk to us about estimating farm level Rs um, for PERS, PERS virus using sequence based transition trees. Nakrim, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm going to talk in topic. Estimating farm level R or reproduction number for PERS using sequence based transmission trees. Let me introduce some of PERS basics and also the transmission trees that we use for tracking the transmission in PERS. So, the first question is how infectious is PERS? So, to ev evaluate that, we use reproduction number or R that um, describes the pathogen spreadability. Reproduction number is equivalent to an average number of individuals infected by a single case. You can see on the right hand side figure, if one pig transmits the virus to three pigs, it might mean um, the R value or reproduction number is equivalent to three, but it's just the animal level R. And we use this R value to evaluate our prevention and um, control measure that is effective or not. So if R is less than one, it means that disease already slowly spread or dies out based on any intervention. But however, now today we use swine disease monitoring programs that archive farm level data rather than using just only the individual level data. And the interventions um, that we got after the result has come is I apply on herd management like biosecurity or feed management or vaccination. So the farm level R is more suitable than the animal level R. But farm level R is not equivalent to animal level R. In order to know that, we need to track the transmission path between the farm. So the key approach for transmission tracking is just sample the pigs that represent each farm and collect 
the virus sample from each pig or the pig that represent the farm and get the genetic sequence of the virus. After that, we compare the first genetic sequence. The sequence we use is all five, occupy only 600 base on the genome, but it is the highly variable regions in course GP5 envelope protein that present major neutralizing epitopes. And it is often used for molecular epidemiology. In the past, we use all five to classify PERS into the RFLP type. Um, this method using the restriction enzyme to cut at a specific site on the off on off five, and if you got the same fragment length, it means that these two sequence or this sequence ha ha have the same IFLP type like one seven four. However, the mutation might occur in between that specific site. So now today we have another kind of finer evaluation is called sequencing that we can call every base on that on the genome or sequence and pairwise compare them. So the question will change to how similar are these two sequences? And we can reconstruct the phylogenetic tree that show the relationship between the virus and also the transmission tree that tracking the virus. So our objectives is using MCHIM or Morrison Swine Health Monitoring Project database that gather more than 1,000 of all five sequences of PERS and also all record of animal movements data to infer the transmission path among farm given PERS genetic relationship. When we got all the paths, we can estimate PERS farm level R and also farm to farm infection chain length. And lastly, we want to better understand the potential modes of PERS transmission. For the methods, I will start with um, an overview of the methods that using the MCHIM database. There, is, there, there are two kinds of database. The first one is PERS of five sequences. The, the second one is animal movement data. PERS of five sequences represent the animal level data of the virus. But animal movement data show how the farm connecting. And we process in the different way of this data. The first one, we um, try to create a transmission tree. The second one, we create a movement network. We combine those kind of results together to estimate farm level reproduction number. For the first one, the sequence data, we use 943 sequences from 651 farms from the single geographic region in USA during 2014 to 17. Most of them were classified as IFLP type 174. We select just only lineage 1A that often um, outbreak during these couple of years in USA. Um, this lineage 1A was classified by Pavlovsky 2019. So we select the subpopulation within lineage 1A using um, the maximum likelihood guide tree and select the cluster that has the pairwise identity of genetic sequence more than 98%. So I got um, the biggest three cluster, cluster A, B, and C, with um, the number of sample from 50 to, to 96. Most of the sample are from breeding herd or sow farm. Um, after these slides, I will show um, the method for each three biggest cluster sequences. So when we got um, the sequences from each cluster, as a primary input, we use that with the evolutionary model and the sampling data of its sample, clock model, and other three priors. Then we reconstruct the time scale phylogeny, which is um, the cladogram that show the relationship between the sample we got and also estimated date for each ancestral node. And we use this time scale phylogeny with generation time of 14.5 days for PERS. Generation time is the time between the onset of symptom of primary case to the time of um, onset of secondary case. Then we combine these uh, time scale phylogeny and generation time to reconstruct the transmission tree that infection paths were inferred between the sample case and unsampled individual peaks were also estimated. 
So you can see here that the black circles mean sample case that we got, and some of them are unsampled. It's show in it what is show in um, blank circle. So the real network is look like this. It's look really complex. It's look really complex, right? And from that point, we got the transmission tree, and then we can convert the simple table that we have from the, the list of sample, the list of farm, and date of sampling to the transmission, the transmission pair table. The transmission pair table will show uh, would show um, who infect whom and also the infection chain length. So infection chain lengths mean the number of peaks between sample A and B. Sample A may from one farm, sample B may from another farm. And infection chain lengths mean the number of unsampled peaks between those two samples. And we convert the transmission pair into farm pair and the date range. So you can see that this table is similar to this diagram, the transmission tree that lay together with the time scale. We also use the animal movement data with uh, the origin column, the destination column. Here is the farm name and the date of movement. What we try to do is combine these two um, data together, transmission tree and animal movement into the new table with um, the new um, parameters. So we capture um, the part that match between transmission tree and animal movement. For example, the first one, the transmission pair from sample A to sample B, the infection chain length is equivalent to six, but there is no movement path length because no recorded movement condition was found or the time range doesn't match the transmission timeline. The second one from sample A to sample C, you can see in the hi orange highlight, there is seven, uh, infection chain link of seven and the movement packling of two because it's from farm X to farm Z and farm Z to farm Y and there is one intermediate which is farm Z. The next one is from B to C. These two samples are from the same, were from the same farm. So the movement packling is zero. It means that there is a retransmission within the farm. And the last one, the yellow highlight from D to E, that from farm Q to farm R, there is infection chingling of three and movement tackling of one. This one is the real farm to farm direct transmission. So from that point, we just focusing on the confirmed farm to farm direct transmission or the movement tackling of one. And we convert this into box plot between infection chain length against movement path length. So like I told, just confirm on the farm to farm direct transmission look at the movement tackling of one, we use the median of infection chain length for movement tackling of one, that we assume that the, the farm pair with the infection chain length less than this, thre this threshold might be the farm that has farm to farm direct transmission. So after we got all the candidate farm to farm direct transmission pairs, we need to determine each recipient because some recipients have more than one source. So we select just only the shortest length, the shortest infection chain length, that should be the most probable source for that recipient. And after that, we can estimate how many farms were transmitted from each. So for example, this red farm transmitted virus to another three, three farms. So uh, for this farm, the reproduction number for this farm is equivalent to three. So the result we got, I will start with um, the infection chain length. Infection chain length, like I told, is mean the number of unsampled peaks between two samples that represent the, the different farm. So cluster A, we have the median of 35 peaks, 28 peaks for cluster B and 46 peaks for cluster C. And you, you, it, it took about 30 to 50 peaks per direct transmission chain length between the farm. And the farm level are, we use the median of reproduction number, all of them is equivalent to one, and it's made up to four to five farm. And interestingly, virus might be transmitted to a downstream, which means from south farm to nursery or to finisher, and also upstream, which means from finisher to breeder herds like south farm. 
these are the diagram from the maximum reproduction number sources. So we can um, see that there, there is some the transmission modes that not related to the movement path, uh, the, the animal movement. So here I show you the pie charts that show the proportion of kinds of movement path links. The first one is the movement path link is equivalent to one in the burgundy um, pieces in each pie. So according to the preliminary result based on movement during strict transmission timeline, only two to 13% of events that first transmit via direct animal movement. And looking at the red pieces in the pie chart, movement packing of two. So two of three events in class A were between the pair of farms located less than 10 kilometers apart. It means that it might be the real path length of two, or it might be the factor that's related to the proximity of farm. And the last one in the blue color is a no movement record. More than 80% of events might not transmit the virus via animal movement because we could not find any uh, movement, animal movement record. But other possible modes of transmission were suspect, like unrecorded connections like feed transportation, personal sharing for mites, or the farm proximity related factor, which 8 to 24% of no movement record has less than 10 kilometers apart between farms per. And the last one is a semen because all of the ball farm in cluster A transmit the virus to south farm and is included in in the no movement record piece. So before I conclude, I would like to uh, clarify the limitations of this study. The first thing is the sampling by S because there is unequal samples among farm types. So we cannot interpret um, using the farm type as an attribute of reproduction number or infection chain length. The second one is smoking gun phenomenon, which is if veterinarian knew the source of current infection, like the previous or current movement from the outbreak farm, they wouldn't sampling pigs. The next one is lack of data on the other modes of transmission, like semen or other kinds of transportation. And the last one is the generation time that we strictly use at 14.5 days for all of them. That is my chain by like um, pig health or um, virus virulence. So for the conclusion, the farm to farm chain length is about 30 to 40 pigs between two samples from two farms. And the farm level R, which means that one farm can transmit to one another farm within one year. So the R is, is just only the median of one, but it can up to five farms within one year. And the risk between farm um, for animal movement is just an iceberg. Um, that we can see from the animal movement record. But underneath the water, it might be semen from proximity and unmeasured risk that attribute to first transmission between farm. So at last, I would like to thank Morrison Swine Health Monitoring Project, MSHIM, participating Swine System, Vanderbilt Lab, CISA Corso, and funding from NSF, USDA NIFA, and Swine Health Information Center. Thank you. Thank you, Nakarin, for this talk on PERS virus. And it seems this is data that can be really, really applied in the field. So um, this is uh, interesting from the uh, field application perspective. Um, with this, we end our third part of the research highlights session of the Lehman Conference. So I wanted to thank you all for your attention, for listening to our talks. And also I wanted to thank all the speakers in this session. We have had 14 very fine speakers, different topics. We hope that you have enjoyed the selection of speakers that we have had. Um, other research abstracts were submitted to the Lehman Conference and were selected for poster presentations. Posters will be um, coming up and there will be an opening uh, ceremony for this as well. So um, we would like for you to um, be able to join and uh, look at the posters and be part of all the social um, events that we have as well. So thanks again on my behalf, on the behalf of Dr. Maxim Sheeran. Thank you.